want to discuss some of the theory that goes into footprinting. Before we go get into the tools and we start getting lost in all of the interfaces and the tools, let's zoom out and let's look at the background of what happens when we're actually footprinting. So ultimately, we're going to have a target. Okay? It could be a company, it could be a person, regardless of what that target is. So this is also the point in which we, they have firewalls and intrusion detection systems or any sort of preventative mechanisms that would be in place that prevent us from having information disclosed. In the footprinting module, it's, it's disclosure oriented. In other words, we're going to take all of the information that's disclosed to us and we're going to use that to our advantage and we're going to document anything and everything. Because it's not until we get the big picture of things until we can start putting that picture together. It's kind of like a puzzle in a sense. But we're going to start one step at a time. So ultimately we've got a target. You know, inside of the company or inside of that target, this is where we can use things like if we could find out their internal DNS scheme. In subtitles we would call that Active Directory, but it could be any directory service. LDAP, NDS, Active Directory to name a few. Also, is there any sort of private websites? If we can get access to those, those are a treasure trove of information because that's where we find things like directories, employee directories, portals, and any sort of private company stuff. So that's always like, you know, the holy grail of the type of stuff that we could find. Next, attack. Dumpster diving. It could be as simple as digging through the trash. Now this also assumes that we have physical access to our target and not every case do we. But if we do have physical access then we want to go ahead and start enumerating D DNS, uh, private websites, dumpster diving, even doing things like shoulder surfing attacks. In many cases you can do a shoulder surfing attack right at the receptionist's front desk. So as soon as you walk into the building, what do you see? What can you learn? You know, we document that stuff as well. And then of course eavesdropping. Eavesdropping can happen just about anywhere. It could be the place where everybody gathers for lunch. It could be inside the office center or corporate center or any sort of nearby restaurant or location in which that facility is going to have access to. But if you notice, there's only a handful of things that we realistically can go after from a footprinting point of view uh, against our target. But if we kind of zoom out and look at what we can do externally over the, the network or over the internet more than likely, there's a lot more information that we can document and use to our advantage. All right? So some of the basic tools that we use in our toolkit at this point is the telephone. Okay? If we can have phone numbers disclosed to us, simply call the phone number up and start social engineering. It could be as simple as that. Also, the network. What type of networks? Is it, you know, backup lines and modems? Or is it, you know, T1 lines, DSL lines, cable modems, satellites? What can we learn from over the network? Also, public websites. What point of presence do they have? Um, how does information get inside the company? Typically nowadays through email or instant messaging of some sort. So we can use that to our advantage. Now I do have a few things prioritized here. The first places that I like to start is with Google doing a quick who is search because that tells us our administrative context um, uh, in the basics, you know, who the DNS servers are and things like that. And we'll see those when we actually look at the tools. So who is information, uh, how their DNS structure is laid out. There's a couple really, really good DNS reconnaissance tools that we can use. Um, and then the social networks. It seems that everybody has a social presence nowadays, so you can use that to your advantage. Is the social networks um, highly popular? Are they being used all the time? Or was their last update to the social sites, you know, a year ago? Okay, all of this needs to be taken into consideration. So Google, who is DNS and social networks is where I like to start. However, we're going to cover all of this and we're going to use the phone, the network, websites, and email to our advantage. But the common things that we like to document here are what are their IP address ranges or network blocks. Um, we always prefer a particular IP address, but there's actually information that can be used with the network block in itself. Because if a company is only using you know, one IP address, but they have the whole block to themselves, well, is there uh, something else that we can find that there aren't readily allowing us to find out and we can learn that from the network block in itself. Also, 
the web server content. You know, while in the basics here, it's HTML or hypertext, we can learn directory structures, we can learn programming languages, we can learn if it's Windows, if it's Linux, Apache, we can learn all of that. So source code, analyzing the source code of the website or whatever source code you can get your hands on is also extremely valuable to us. And in some cases, we just like to mirror the whole website to ourselves. The bad part about this attack is that it's extremely active because you're going out to that website and you're basically duplicating it so you can analyze it in your uh, home lab or office lab or something like that. Um, but between looking at the source codes, mirroring the websites, you may be able to determine what operating systems they are running. And we, of course, we would document that through the client and server process. Also, publicly, we would look at directories or databases. Um, we're going to use search engines and not just Google. Uh, sometimes Google displays a handful of results, but there's other search engines and we need to use all of them because in many cases we're looking for that one tiny piece of information and if we can use that one tiny piece of information that wasn't on Google, that may lead to a compromise. Also, URL analysis. How is their URLs laid out? What are they disclosing in the URL versus what are they not disclosing in the URL? We can learn about how you know, how important they take security just by what they're allowing us, the end user, to see. Also, Google Earth. In many cases, if we get addresses from something like who is, I just pop that in a simple Google Earth um, search and see if I can't see the front door of the building. In some cases, you can go right to the front door. In other um, cases, you might only see like the business park or, you know, across the street or something to that effect. Also, people sites, if you can learn about the different employees that work at that organization, you can not only go after them and the relationship of the employee to the actual um, company, but also you can learn about the people themselves. What are their skill sets? What backgrounds do they have? And things like that. Also, financially. There's lots of information. If it's a public company, can you go after a financial analysis? There's probably going to be some buzz there if it's a larger company versus if it's a smaller company. Also, job sites. If they're advertising, hey, we need a Windows NT 4.0 uh, migration expert, chances are they're going to have some NT4.0 servers that they need migrated. Okay, So job sites, um, also alerting web, uh, websites. Now it's one thing for us to go find information about our target, but it's another thing altogether to set up an alert at something like Google Alerts or Giga Alert, which is a paid service, and have that information either emailed to us or have that email find us so that way we don't have to constantly go out and search for it. So in some cases, I just set up um, alerts and have the information find me. Also, archived websites. There's a handful of places on the internet where you can find cache content or you can use something like archive.org where there actually is a copy of maybe some historical content. Um, one of my favorite things to do in class is to actually, you know, pull up Microsoft's first, uh, you know, uh, homepage or what was uh, MySpace, the first version of MySpace or something like that. And you can find those on the archive websites. Um, also, there's monitoring websites. If you can just look at some of the monitoring websites and see maybe their operating system version or something like that, we can use that to our advantage. Okay. Also, you know, this is a little bit more of a stretch, but it has resulted in good information in the past. Is there any sort of patent or trademark information about your target? What are their customers doing? Nowadays, that just happens to be integrated with social networks and something like Twitter. All right, what are, do they have customer portals or something like that? Or what about press releases? If they're advertising a new product or new launch of something. Um, and then nonetheless, we'll wrap up with Google hacking. Google hacking techniques and using the Google hacking database or all of the possible Google hacking commands, this can make this whole analysis of footprinting very, very easy. So as you can imagine, there's a lot to document here and a, a lot to report. Uh, when you're creating your pen testing report, but nonetheless, that's the important part, okay? So let's summarize. You have external resources available to you during a pen test. You have internal resources available to you during a pen test. You sit out here, and the only thing in between you and your target is a handful of tools and techniques. 
So when you document this stuff appropriately, you start putting that puzzle piece together. Now, here's the caveat. Most people that are new to the world of pen testing, they get lost on all of the tools and techniques. Well, if you start from a tool-centric point of view, you will get lost. But let's take a step back, let's look at the big picture. Once you understand that, that big picture is realistically putting the pieces of a puzzle together, all of this will become a lot easier for you to understand. Internal versus external, lots of documentation. And this is the foundation to what we're gonna see in the hands-on-hands -hands approach to penetration testing.